Hi, I'm Amber Butchart, fashion historian. I'm here today at English Heritage's Kenilworth Castle. In 1575, this castle welcomed Elizabeth I for 19 days at the invitation of her favourite, Robert Dudley. Today, we're going to explore Elizabeth I's iconic look and discover what her makeup can teach us about her reign. So join me as we meet our Queen and we show you how to create an Elizabeth I inspired look at home. Your Majesty. Well, she's not ready yet. It would have taken Queen Elizabeth a good couple of hours to get herself up to scratch. I'm sure. Now, Elizabeth I, one of the most recognisable women in British history, talk me through her look. I feel like her look is iconic and there were three main parts to it. So it was porcelain white, clean, clear skin. She had rosy cheeks and then beautiful ruby lips. And how are you going to recreate that today on Annette? So we're going to be using either modern equivalents of Elizabethan products or ones that are a little bit more authentic to the time. Oh, that's exciting. Now, modern equivalents, I'm assuming that's because some of the original ingredients could be quite harmful. Yeah, so some of the ingredients that Elizabeth was using on her face, things like lead, are actually toxic. And we don't want to kill our model today. So we're using ones from modern times that give you the same effect. That's a relief. <laughs> so what are we going to start with? So we're going to start with our priming stage and we're using egg whites. Egg whites were used a lot in Elizabethan times and they were used to tighten the skin, reduce the size of pores and also they helped to prevent freckles from appearing which were a big no-no at that time. Oh I see, so almost like sort of like a primer or a mask today? Yeah, really similar to a primer or a mask. I've actually been trying this out on myself and I love it and my skin looks even better. Really? Yeah. So we could use this today? Totally. Yeah, you should try it. Oh, I definitely, definitely will. It's kind of like a cooking show <laughs> instead of makeup. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, I'm so interested to see how it feels and, and how it looks as well. So what I'm going to do is it's one egg white and I foamed it up so there's a bit of texture in there and then I'm going to use a natural hair brush just to smooth it all over Annette's skin. So is this actually a makeup brush? It's actually a paintbrush, but it's close to um, what you would have used at the time. So a bundle of animal hair on a wooden handle. I am loving this. Paintbrush, egg white. This is not at all what I was expecting. Brilliant. <laughs> so now I'm going to start painting it on. We'll start up on the forehead and work our way around the skin. Wow, how does that feel, Annette? It feels really nice, actually. It's really smooth. It looks like you're being glazed. <laughs> yeah, that is what it feels like. <laughs> yeah, and actually, egg white was used as a varnish and an end stage to a lot of makeups to make the skin look smooth. It has kind of a sheen to it as well. Mm -hmm. And you'll know that it started to set when it becomes completely matte. So I'm going to do two layers and then we'll leave it for 15 minutes to set down and then we'll remove it. So is two the optimum amount of layers that you want to? Two is the optimum amount of layers, yeah, for maximum softness and maximum tightening. Great. Okay, it's all set, so now it's time to remove it. How does it feel now that it's set? It feels a bit tighter and it feels a little bit like when you put PVA glue on your hands <laughs> as a kid. And then <laughs> peel it off again. Yeah, yeah. So it's quite relaxing. And this is rose water, is it? Yes. It smells delicious. It smells amazing. So rose water was known for its soothing and astringent properties. And I'm removing it with a linen cloth, which is the Elizabethan equivalent of a wet wipe. So it's so much better for your skin, isn't it, to use a linen cloth rather than a... It's so nice for your skin and it's environmentally friendly. So in the 16th century, Elizabeth would have used ceruse as a foundation. Tell me about that. So ceruse was made from white lead mixed with borax or vinegar or lemon juice. And the thing about that is it's extremely toxic to the skin. And eventually the moisture from your skin would react with those chemicals and slowly eat away your flesh. Nasty. So we're not using that today, I'm hoping. We're definitely not using that today, no. So a white water-based face paint is the key to this. Much easier, much more gentle on the skin. That creates the same effect. Creates the same effect. That really, really is white, isn't it? You can see it giving, you know, that sort of idea of virginal purity that was so important to her image. 
And it's going on quite thick as well, isn't it? My understanding is that she would have to put more and more on as she got older to cover her skin damage, is, is that right? Yeah, and we know that Elizabeth had smallpox as a young lady and those were scars that she was quite conscious of. So she wanted to cover those up. And also as the effects of the ceruse took hold, she had to wear more and more to cover that up. So the irony being that your, your skin is getting worse and worse and you're putting more and more of this toxic substance on it to try and cover up the effects of the actual product itself. So then it gets worse and worse and worse and you're in a vicious cycle. I've mixed up a lip colour for us to use and I'm gonna go ahead and put it on. And while I'm applying it, I'm really interested in your take on Elizabeth as a trendsetter. Well, at the time that Elizabeth was queen, the monarchy was really the head of fashion. Not only were they the head of state, but they were also really ahead in the style stakes. So everybody wanted to dress like the queen um, or to sort of emulate the, the women in the court circles around her, really. So like celebrities today, kind of? Exactly, exactly. It's not so much the monarchy anymore, it's more celebrities or Instagram stars who kind of set the kind of trends that Elizabeth was setting back when she was queen. But it could only go so far because Elizabeth was also really keen on issuing these edicts and proclamations about what people could and couldn't wear. So this would regulate the sort of fabrics that different people could wear and even the sort of size of the stuffing that they could use to create their, uh, you know, very extreme Tudor silhouettes. Now, one of the reasons for this was that it was really important at this time to be able to tell just by looking at someone their status in society. So there was a lot of anxiety around sort of dressing above your station. So this was really important and Elizabeth was really keen to sort of keep a check on this. But some of her statement looks kind of really stay with us today, like this very strong red lip that you're doing here. Yes, I think you might be a fan of this lip. Very much so. What's involved in this? What are you using? So I've used a um, synthetic version of a vermilion pigment, so it's like a loose powder pigment, and I've mixed it with just a normal lip balm. Just a normal lip balm. So again, not poisonous. Not poisonous, no. And shape-wise, she really liked a smaller, more compact mouth because it made your eyes look bigger. So that's the shape I've gone with. Now at this time, the health of the nation was really projected through the body of the monarch. And I'm guessing that blush had a crucial role to play in this. Is that right? Yeah, it was an important concept for the Elizabethans and blush adds life and health to, to the skin. And if the queen looks healthy, then the country's healthy. So. I'm applying it in a place that makes you look as if you're naturally flushing. So it comes down from the cheekbone in a downward triangle motion. Down from the cheekbone? Down from the cheekbone. So that's quite different to how we apply blush today, isn't it? It's really different. It's much less structured. You don't see a contour in it. It's all about where you would naturally blush upwards from. And what are you using to create this Elizabethan blush? So this is quite an authentic recipe. This is a mixture of crushed madder root mixed with beeswax. Um, and with madder you get this really beautiful, slightly orangey red tone that makes this really nice blush colour. It does look quite natural, doesn't it? Quite a natural colour. The madder was used to dye clothes as well, to dye fabric, so it clearly had a number of uses. Yeah, it time. was used a lot. In the portraits that we have of Elizabeth, there's really not much going on in the eye and especially the eyebrow area. How are you going to do that? Well, we could bleach or we could pluck, but I'm not going to this time. To keep it more accessible, I'm going to use some concealer just to make Annette's eyebrows look less prominent and more Elizabethan. Because in the Elizabethan times, having fine eyebrows and a high hairline were considered the real points of beauty. So this, you know, the really thin or no eyebrows, it's the complete antithesis of the sort of eyebrow trends that we have today, yeah. aren't they? It's like anti-Instagram brow to have no <laughs> eyebrow whatsoever. Well, I'm going to leave you guys to add the finishing touches and I'm going to go and find out more about Elizabeth's visit to Kenilworth Castle. So I look forward to coming back later and meeting the Queen.
Richard, tell me about Kenilworth Castle and the people who lived here. Well, it was built in the 1120s, and over the next few centuries, it was in and out of royal control, until in 1563, Elizabeth I gave it to Robert Dudley. And so she visited him here a few times. What happened in 1575? That's right. It was Elizabeth's fourth and final visit here. It was a really grand affair. Um, it was the longest stay she had at any of her courtiers' castles. So there was feasting, uh, specially written dramas and plays put on, and even some fireworks. And what do Elizabeth's dress and makeup tell us about her as a person? Well, people writing at the time give us quite a rich impression of who she was. She was conscious about how she was seen. And the way she presented herself was as the virginal queen, emphasising that she was enough as a ruler without sacrificing her power by marrying someone else. Thanks, Richard. I'm going to go back and check on the majestic makeover. Wow, Annette, you look amazing. Rebecca, you've done such a fantastic job. Thank you very much. I love the wig. Yeah, I think the wig is fantastic. And I love the pearls dotted into it as well because pearls were quite special to Queen Elizabeth. Definitely, they were known to symbolise chastity. So it's absolutely perfect that the Virgin Queen would be dotted with these kind of symbols. You just look so amazing. And this fabric as well would have been created using actual gold thread. So she would have been this real sort of otherworldly image of regal splendour. You look absolutely amazing, Annette. Thank you for being a fantastic model. Do you feel splendid and otherworldly? I do. I actually feel quite strong in this. In fact, I think I'm ready to explore my castle. Today we've shown you how you can achieve an Elizabethan look that's a lot less deadly than our 16th century ancestors. Elizabeth's makeup fed into the cult of the Virgin Queen and has left us with an enduring image of her as an iconic ruler. Is there a historic makeup look that you'd like to see us recreate? If so, leave us a comment. Until then, I'm Amber Butchart and thanks for joining us at Kenilworth Castle. <laughs>